And hello, everyone. We are so excited to have you here today. Um, as Christina said, my name is Rena Saltzman, and I am on the marketing team here at Raymond. And as you all know, cybersecurity is a common um, a common theme in the business world as cyber threats continue to grow every single day. And it is something that is now top of mind for many business owners, small to mid-sized businesses across industry. And I am excited to be here today with um, Jim Carp and Paul Kennedy, who are going to be leading this discussion around cybersecurity and why you should give a damn. And with that, I am going to let Jim start us off and bring us through what we're going to talk about today. Thank you, Rena and uh, Paul. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. And thank you, uh, everybody that's out there joining us today. Uh, we've got five basic agenda items here that we're going to cover in the next 45 minutes. And as they stated up front, if you have questions, please ask them, get them uh, in there. We can monitor the questions. We'll hold them until the tail end so that we can keep the flow going. But in either case, what we're going to do is just to make sure everybody has the same reference space here, we're going to do a quick overview of cybersecurity. And then what we're going to do is talk about the cybersecurity framework. Now, that was built by NIST, and that can be the foundation for a solid program. Then also, a lot of times, people are, are perplexed as to what is the risks and what are the costs associated with a data breach. And we can give you a quick calculator uh, based on that, so you can kind of figure out what your risk and what your exposures are, and then you can determine an appropriate path forward. Also, Paul will share with you a little bit of the strategy. How do you build out? a robust cybersecurity program. And then ultimately at the tail end, then we'll say, okay, what are the minimum minimum tenants that you'd need to have in place to have a program all put together? So as we looked and you start the program, you say, you know, what does a dam really have to do uh, with cybersecurity? And ultimately, why should I care? And if you look at it from a dam perspective, it's, it's relatively straightforward. Dams are built to control, restrict, as well as stop the flow of water. And cybersecurity is really very similar to a dam. You wanna be able to protect your organization from the outside world. And if you look at it, data is very, very similar to water. It's malleable, it's ever-changing, and it definitely has value. And from a river perspective, if you look at flowing water, we could use the analogy of the flowing water with the data going through it is a stream, a river, and then the flow of that information that goes in. So it's very similar to the internet. And so with that, having that as the backdrop, the important aspect is, is that you wanna be able to control that flow. And that's exactly as an organization, what you wanna be able to do from the cybersecurity perspective is to be able to protect everything that's associated with that. So the best way to be able to do that is to engineer things appropriately. And if you're building a dam, you have to be able to understand the soil, the content of the soil, how it's all put together, as well as the water pressures. And that all needs to be done in advance. And it's very similar for you as an organization as well, is to be able to have that plan and strategy in place. And uh, right here, as it pops up, we've got, right, if you're looking right here, this is the Edenville Dam. This was up in uh, upstream from Midland, Michigan, and in 2020, the dam actually broke. And uh, they, we've got the video playing. It's a little bit slow uh, from that vantage point. I think it's a little bit of the internet that we've got going here at this point. But now the case, as you see right here towards the tail end, the water started to rush through. So this dam was built in the 1920s. And in the 1920s, they had different technology than they do today. But the important aspect is, is that once it's built and just as importantly is maintained, you can make sure that you can prevent. Because what ended up happening, this washed out, then it went down to the Sanford Dam, doubled the pressure on that, that broke. Midland got flooded and went all the way downstream right into Lake Huron. Uh, eventually, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people caught everything in the news. So the important aspect is, is in the 20s, they built this, but you also have to maintain it and keep things current and keep things going uh, from that vantage point. So data breaches are very similar to that. If, uh, if you get breached, there could be a lot of ramifications in the back of your organization and really create a lot of difficulties for you. 
ultimately water you know you have, we've all heard that water seeks the course of least resistance the hackers do too and that that is a lot of times where people are vulnerable from that that aspect and that point so ultimately your defenses are only as good as the plan that you put in place so the key here is the plan and making sure that everything is all set up front and so with that we you know from the the perspective is one of the most important steps is the planning phase right up front before anything starts. Then secondly, you need to really understand your current environment. Yet, lots of organizations skip this pro part of the process. They go straight into uh, appropriating tools, putting different things, deploying everything without having that master plan. And that's where things can end up being fatal. So at this point, I'd like to hand it right off to uh, Paul. Paul, let's give him that basic framework now and looking at it from the cybersecurity perspective, Give us the overview and uh, we'll take it away. Thanks, Jim. Uh, every time I hear that analogy of the dam and, and the water flow, it, it feels more and more appropriate based on all the headlines we see. Um, and as you said, many organizations jump straight to implementing tools and you know finding some flashy solution versus taking a step back and really planning their approach and building a cybersecurity strategy. Um, if you don't, you know, build that plan appropriately before you start building the tools, you're going to leave yourselves with holes. So uh, let's talk uh, through those agenda items as uh, you referenced earlier. We're going to start off with a quick overview of cybersecurity, some of the basic concepts, just make sure that we're all talking the same language as we talk about cybersecurity. We'll also talk a little bit about some current trends over the course of this uh, and the, the real world data that we're seeing out there. Uh, about what organizations are facing. So Robert Mueller has a somewhat famous quote uh, about there being only two types of companies. Those that have been hacked, those will be. I think as we look at some of the data later on, you know, you might say that he actually should have said something along the lines of there are only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that don't know they've been hacked yet. Uh, it it's, can be rather scary how long attackers will actually sit in a network before they take uh, malicious action, just doing reconnaissance and gathering information about the organization. So what are we attempting to accomplish today? We want to develop this common framework or common language for discussing cybersecurity, as I just talked about. Uh, we want to provide your leadership a high level visibility of your current security environment and determine next steps for building out a robust cybersecurity strategy. These are generally applicable steps that any organization can put in place. Um, and really focuses on starting with that strategy. Many organizations uh, think about, uh, or will go look up a, a cybersecurity and you might use a dictionary to actually find it. You'll probably find some long complex definition like this. Um, and I think that actually this, comp this definition works well in that it's hard to read and hard to understand. For many companies that I talk to, protecting their organizations from cybersecurity threats feels even more intimidating than that definition. I like to personally boil it down to what is the goal of cybersecurity? I find this much more effective way for organizations to understand what are we actually trying to accomplish? Ultimately, cybersecurity is about protecting what you see on screen here, what's referred to as the cybersecurity triad. You need to be able to protect confidentiality of your data, your, your key business plans, key you know, sensitive information or data assets that you have in your organization. You need to make sure that only the right people have access to that information, whether it's internal or external users. You need to be able to rely on the integrity of your information so that you know that the information you have is correct. So oftentimes with a, a common scam these days is switching out the account numbers for someone's ACH transactions with one of your vendors. And so you, that's an attack on the integrity of the data assets that you have. You also need access to those assets when you go to use them. Those assets probably are very key to running your organization or your business. And so in making sure that they're available to you when you need to use them in the course of your daily business, otherwise you might be stuck, not able to provide the services or manufacture the parts that you are specialized in doing. And so as we think about cybersecurity, instead of worrying about some super complex definition and all every single nuance of, of the process, let's start by boiling it down to the three basics and figure out how we protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your environment. As we go about that, uh, protecting that triad, we want to think about the risks. Risks can stem from three main areas. You have your environmental risks. We had just a great video uh, or a great 
illustration of the environmental risk with that dam breaking uh, in Eastern Michigan. So those can be environmental risks like fire, water, tornadoes, floods, earthquakes, et cetera. Uh, you have to consider those. Business resource risks, whether that's equipment failure, uh, resources as in the employees that you have, a failure in, in their actions, some sort of supply chain disruption or vendor disruption. Uh, all too many headlines came from third-party risk related to supply chain disruption over the past couple of years or your employees. And then finally, probably what most people think about is hostile actors, those attackers, those hackers that are actually trying to break into your environment. Um, and now we'll see some stats later on, but we have to consider all of these as we're thinking about cybersecurity. So as we're thinking about cybersecurity, we wanna think about the what, what, how do we actually figure out what those risks are for each organization? We need to start this by kind of calculating, and this doesn't have to be a super formal calculation. This can be estimates and, um, and can be high, medium, low for each of these areas, things like that. But we wanna start by actually identifying what the threats are that are likely to be faced by your organization. We then need to determine the vulnerabilities could, that could lead to those threats being realized. What would actually lead to one of those threats actually happening? What would lead to an attacker actually sitting inside your network? Um, and then what's the likelihood of each of those vulnerabilities actually happening? Um, so that you can then start figuring out where to start protecting your resources. If that vulnerability does actually uh, come to fruition, you know, the attacker does get inside your network, what's the impact as they start looking at the different assets in your environment, tend to, you know, encrypting those through ransomware, uh, changing the data, et cetera. So you have to think about these, this kind of calculation and the ultimate impact on the, the cybersecurity triad that we just talked about as you're figuring out how to protect your environment. So a lot, you know, that, comp that calculation can feel complex, but ultimately we just need to think about what assets you have, what's the impact if the, something happens to those assets, and how, what protections do we need to put in place in order to address the specific vulnerabilities uh, for those assets. As we talk about impact in that calculation, there's lots of different places those risks can actually impact uh, your environment through an incident. Uh, those, an incident could result in loss of critical information to actually running your business, like I was just talking about. You, as a result, you could wind up losing business income. If you can't actually manufacture and ship out parts in your manufacturing organization, then you probably have some number of days of, of lost income because you, you probably can't make up some of that time. Decreased productivity for your employees. Uh, if they can't access the assets that are they need to actually do their jobs, they may uh, have decreased productivity. Uh, you might wind up with inaccurate information that could lead to other financial losses. If you're in the headlines or uh, you have to go send out notifications to your customers, you could wind up with significant reputational damage uh, and damage to the trust of your customers in your actual business or organization. You wind up with damage to your credit. If you're not actually able to uh, secure financing to continue the organization's business. Or if you're in a regulated environment, you can wind up with significant regulatory fines. So there's lots of different ways these, these different cybersecurity risks can actually impact your environment and lead to significant damage to your organization. Security considerations. So now that we've talked about the, where those risks can happen and, and where they can, how they can impact your business, we can start thinking about how do we start protecting your business. And so as you look at protecting your organization, there's a number of different areas that you wanna be thinking about. And you have to make sure that we're covering all of these areas, because as you see in that last box in the bottom right, completeness makes means that we really need to make sure we're covering all those areas because a weakness in one can lead to uh, downstream effects on other dams like Jim was talking about in those other areas. And so we need to be thinking about physical security. Don't forget the security of your actual location and your employees where they're working. Um, personal security, thinking about your employees. Do you actually know who's working for you? Have you done robust background checks on, on who they are and to put controls in place to monitor activity? Have you planned for different contingencies? Have you built an incident response plan? Have you developed a business continuity and disaster recovery plan so that you have a plan in place for when something goes wrong, because something will go wrong eventually. And so if you're prepared for that, you can be much more effective at resuming your normal business operations. As you're thinking about protecting your assets, 
Are you protecting your operational security, the keys to your future success, your organization that you should be keeping confidential, things like that? Um, how are you protecting those assets as well? And then privacy. I think a lot of people think about privacy. There's a lot of privacy headlines, but are you protecting any personal information of your employees, customers, or consumers uh, for the data that you do have? As we continue to think about uh, deploying protections in any environment, we want to think about people, process, and technology. Humans are your weakest link. However, they also can be one of your best assets in protecting your environment. You wanna be thinking about how do you train those people to make them into assets for protecting your environment instead of weaknesses. And that really comes through how do you actually deploy your training? You wanna make sure you've captured your processes and formal procedures and policies. Uh, policies and procedures allow you to actually transfer the information that you need to your employees, allow other individuals to pick up those processes when someone leaves and make sure those processes are repeatable. And then finally, technology. We, we mentioned that uh, a lot of folks jump right to that technology piece, but you wanna make sure that you're deploying the right technology for your specific environment based on your organization's strategy. Key being first to have developed a strategy. That strategy is really gonna come from your governance process. Governance uh, can be a scary topic for, frankly, a lot of small, medium-sized businesses. It can be challenging to have sufficient you know, rigor in that process so that you can actually have it managing all the pieces you need to. Um, but it is important, especially when you think about cybersecurity. Good cybersecurity comes from a good governance process. Good governance looks like having your ownership and leadership team engaged and involved in the process of identifying, assessing, and responding to risk. Cybersecurity is ultimately a business risk, not an IT risk. The IT teams in your organizations can help you respond to those risks and put controls in place for you. But ultimately, you need to have uh, aligned your cybersecurity strategy with your organizational strategy. So you need to, be make sure, need to be making sure that you're bringing that whole organizational team, at least leadership team, to the table as you're thinking about what your cybersecurity strategy should be. When you have that team at the table and you're figuring out where to focus your efforts, you wanna think about strategic alignment. Is the, as I just mentioned, is the cybersecurity strategy, your IT strategy, are those aligned with the actual strategy of the business? You wanna think about value delivery. What are you actually looking to get out of your program uh, so that you can make sure you're making the decisions to select the right tools, the right processes, the right security controls for your specific business? You need to be thinking about risk management. How do you address those IT related risks from using the internet, from using systems or, or even email, simple things like that. So there's IT related risks out there that can impact the business, but then how also does the, the IT team, the IT tools and technologies you have help you manage your business risks? Resource management, whether that's budget, people, any of the above. How do you make sure that you, you're deploying your resources in the most effective manner? Performance measurement, as you look at across all of these, how do you actually measure whether or not your program's succeeding? So as you have built this leadership team together and you pull them to that cybersecurity table, these are the things that that leadership team should be thinking about. So, so, so Paul, as, as, we, as we look right here right now, you've covered kind of the waterfront and looking at all the different aspects. It's almost a little bit overwhelming. Okay. If, if you look at it from a, if I'm, if I'm a medium sized to small size organization, uh, it, it can be a lot. You know, you're talking governance, you're talking all the risks, the confidentiality, integrity, availability. You talked about completeness of, along those aspects. What, what's the best way to set that foundation and kind of get things moving forward from your vantage point? You're spot on, Jim. This can be a very intimidating process. And so, but the, the reality is there's tools out there to help us. One of those tools, you mentioned this at the start, and we'll go spend a little bit more time on this, is the NIST cybersecurity framework. The NIST cybersecurity framework is a framework that was put out by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, a semi-governmental organization that helps in a lot of different areas with developing standards. But what they really created was a common language for understanding and managing your cybersecurity risk. Uh, it gives you a platform that's a good foundational platform for leading you towards the right types of controls you should have in place. It's not prescriptive. It's not saying, hey, you need to have this specific you know, antivirus technology in your environment. It's more saying, hey, have you thought about the concept of antivirus and how you will deploy that? So the NIST cybersecurity framework, which we'll talk about and we'll continue to talk about here, 
gives that good foundation for organizations to simplify the, the discussion around cybersecurity, although at times you'll see it still can be complex. It can help you manage that risk across the entirety of the organization and make sure you're deploying those, those correct controls. So the NIST cybersecurity framework or CSF breaks down into five functional areas. Identify and protect are two proactive functional areas, the things you do up front. So have you identified the assets, threats, and vulnerabilities and the current processes in your organization that you need to be protecting? And then have you deployed protections customized to your specific environment? So these are the two proactive pieces that you should be doing on an ongoing basis. And then three functional areas related to actually responding to an incident. Will you be able to detect an incident when it has occurred or is ongoing? Will you be able to respond to that incident? Do you have the plans in place to actually be able to uh, respond effectively? And how will you recover back to your normal business operations? Uh, the NIST CSF's been around since 2018. A lot of organizations already picked this up and there's other great frameworks out there as well. But we find the NIST CSF is, is great foundational frameworks that, for organizations that are really starting that journey or are fairly early in the maturity of their, their cybersecurity processes. Uh, and even though it can be simple, it can be more complex. However, there's a lot more significantly more complex frameworks out there. So the NIST CSF, excuse me, the NIST CSF really uh, provides that goal of, of helping to eliminate the complexity and making cybersecurity implementable for organizations that uh, probably have less of those security processes in place now. As a part of that, um, they also talk about risk tolerance. And so as you think about your organization, uh, and I, I just talked about how this is not a one size, uh, this is not a necessarily a, a super prescriptive approach because different organizations are gonna have different willingness to accept risk. And so alongside the NIST CSF, they've also put out risk tiers as part of this. And so this is really boils down to how proactive do you wanna be in managing your risk? Some organizations are gonna say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna stay down to, towards the lower end of how proactive I'm going to be and maybe stay down to tier one or partial. Um, some organizations can say, hey, I wanna deploy top of the line security controls. I'm very concerned about security to the point that I'm gonna be constantly measuring the performance of my security environment. And so these tiers break down into several layers or uh, four different layers. Uh, first is the uh, partial, in which I was just talking about, where you're going to probably not have a lot of formal policy and procedure in place. You're going to respond uh, in a reactive manner for the specific scenario that pops up, and, but you might not have a plan in place to actually address it. Next step up from there is uh, informed, where you, you've started to develop these processes. You may not have documented them, but you probably have some plans in place in the back of someone's mind. I think a lot of organizations are probably somewhere within this uh, tier two at the moment. Tier three, I think, is where a lot of organizations strive to be, which is repeatable. This is where you now have your processes documented. You're actually, you've formally adopted specific processes in order, and tools and controls in order to manage your risk. You've developed that strategy across the whole waterfront to make sure that you're covering all the assets that you should be. Uh, but it, this is a, at this point, you're, you have that documentation in place, but you probably are, are measuring it less than the final layer of adaptive. And the adaptive tier is going to be for organizations that are really focused on saying, hey, I have a very significant amount of cybersecurity risk. I want to be constantly measuring the performance of my program and can, doing a continuous improvement model. While I would think all organizations should be thinking about continuous improvement, this is a focus on that constant continuous improvement of feeding that data back in and, and changing the processes uh, on a nonstop basis so that you can actually continue to refine your controls. So, so Paul, so, leave, sitting right here and looking at these where we have partial, informed, repeatable, and adaptive, a lot of times questions that we get from our clients is basically, where should I end up? And, and a lot of people are starting in, in the partial and eventually maybe ending up in the informed, repeatable. Not a ton end up at the adaptive. It, it gets expensive. And so, and so that's, that's where I think we should go next is basically, how do you determine how much should you invest compared to the risks that are associated with it so it makes sense and it's something that the organization can take care of. So uh, we wanna make sure that we're thinking about the actual breach costs as we're customizing the process for each, of, each organization that's thinking about their cybersecurity journey. And next we're gonna be thinking about how do you actually calculate that? 
uh, which I think is answering your question, Jim. You got it. And so uh, there's some great data out there that's available to organizations uh, to actually start calculating what their exposure is. However, you do have to set some time aside to actually think about this and be proactive about it. So what's, what is the actual cost of a breach? It's gonna be highly dependent upon the organization and what your specific environment is. So every organization I would choose that's on the call here, I would, I would encourage to be thinking about this. Uh, and there's a great resource out there from the Ponton Institute based here in Michigan. Every year they work with IBM security to uh, put out a report, cost of a data breach report. And there's some other great data out there from you know, Verizon puts out a, a pretty good security report as well. But in the most recent Poneman report, uh, they found that on average, the cost of a data breach is over $4 million, significantly over $4 million. And the thing that I would keep in mind is that while that's an average across all data breaches they surveyed, regardless of the size of the organizations, I would stress for the people on this call that being a smaller, medium-sized business is actually a disadvantage for those costs because those costs, while they do scale down as you get to be a smaller organization, they don't scale down proportional to the size of the business. So, uh, as you look at, the, say, the number of employees or the amount of revenue, a smaller organization has a, a much more significant impact on the size of the business from cybersecurity risk than larger organizations do because oftentimes those larger organizations have the budgets to deploy more robust security controls. Some other great data out of that, um, as you look at the average cost for a lost PII record, personally identifiable information, PII, it comes out to about $180 on average across all industries. Uh, it, which industry you're in, as you'll see in the bottom right there, can significantly impact uh, what your cost is. With If you're in the healthcare industry, this can be a scary number. The average cost in the healthcare industry was over $9 million since they have so much uh, healthcare, you know, health related information, so much sensitive information to all of their customers. I mentioned earlier the time that uh, attackers will actually sit in a network. And this is where that stat comes out. So on average, uh, in Poneman's research, they found that attackers or data breaches often were occurring for close to nine months or, or sometimes even up to a year before they were fully contained. So you'll see here, there's on average 287 days to fully identify and contain a breach. When they, when they broke that down further, they found that it was actually 212 days in 2021 for that breach to even be detected and then additional 75 days to fully contain it. So think about that stat, 212 days, seven months for that an attacker might be sitting inside your network, figuring out what they can do uh, before they actually are detected and stopped. So uh, as you think about your environment, will you have the ability to detect that attacker sooner? Because the sooner that you detect that attacker and stop them, the less damage they can do. Some other things that Poneman found um, as they looked at uh, the root cause of the breaches and attacks, as you would expect, a significant amount of that did come from malicious attackers. However, I'd point out that close to half of the root causes were not actually specifically from, a root, uh, from an attacker. It was some sort of system misconfiguration or glitch or human error. So close to half of all data breaches came from some sort of internally caused issue. Uh, and so as you think about deploying your security controls, it's not just protecting against attackers, it's also protecting against your own internal errors. As they looked at where those costs actually came from, they found that uh, about two thirds did come from specifically responding to the incident. However, that still leaves about a third that actually came from lost business. And earlier I mentioned the reputational damage that can come from a cybersecurity incident. And so thinking about that, you wanna make sure that you're thinking about uh, how will you protect your reputation? Because it's more than just the costs that are going to stem from the incident. You also could be losing business as a result of a cybersecurity incident. Uh, on here, I'd highlight a couple of facts. Uh, so uh, when you did have the, about that half that came from malicious attacker, that was significantly more expensive. Costs increased about 25% from a malicious attack, which probably makes sense. Um, and then I talked about how quickly can you respond to that incident. Attacks uh, with a life cycle of greater than 200 days were 30% more costly than attacks uh, that were caught early in the process. Some other key observations, talk about lost business, uh, long-term impact that you may have some immediate costs, about half the costs do occur in that first year of responding to an incident. However, 
the other half do continue to trail up to three or more years after the incident. So when you do have that cybersecurity incident, if you're not prepared to respond effectively, those costs will continue to haunt your business or your organization for a long time. I mentioned the small and medium size business cost disadvantage, which is very key. Keep in mind that as a smaller organization, you may be more uh, susceptible to uh, a proportional impact from uh, some sort of incident. Earlier, I mentioned the uh, costs are not consistent by industry. So health, healthcare, as you can see here, is by far and away the average cost per record in, in impact is way above every other. There, I believe it was about $429 per record they found. However, finance and other organizations are not that far behind. Finance, I think, was well over $200. Um, and then as you look across the different industries, you can see where the average about $180 per record comes from. This then also ties to the average total cost by industry. And you'll see, you know, and these line up pretty proportionally with the uh, cost per record by, in, by industry. So you can take these data figures that I just talked about, they're available in the, the Poneman Institute report that they publish for free. Uh, and you can use those numbers to start calculating what your impact is for your organization. I think there's two very key numbers to think about here. One is the cost per record that I just talked about, but there's gonna be a significant uh, set of organizations, I think manufacturing organizations jump to mind, where you're probably not as worried about the specific data assets you have, but you are worried about your ability to continue producing whatever you're manufacturing. And so you probably have a significant cost per day of downtime. When you look at ransomware statistics, uh, the average downtime from a ransomware incident was uh, 10 to 15 business days. And so you can do these calculations based on either figure. You can think about what's your specific organization's cost for a day of downtime, or what's, your, what's the data that you have that uh, would be uh, beneficial to an attacker and could cause you to lose money. So I, I built a couple examples here of what this could specifically look like when you're trying to build this calculation. Say you're a, a primary care physician and you're worried about your, your clinic's security. When you look at the average number of patients for a, a PCP, which is over 2,300, and you multiply that by the $429 per record, you can see that an average PCP probably has about an exposure of, of close to a million dollars in a cybersecurity incident. The alternative uh, calculation is your, is your manufacturing business. Uh, $25 million annual revenue manufacturer breaks down to about $100,000 per day of revenue. And so if you can't manufacture or ship out parts for 10 to 15 business days, your, your exposure very quickly accumulates. And uh, so that ransomware incident shut down your ability to access your blueprints and your manufacturing plans. Um, and so you can't actually produce those parts. You don't wind up shipping anything out for three weeks and you've now lost the $1.5 million of revenue. It adds up very quickly. And you don't have to be that big of a business to have a significant exposure uh, in the event of some sort of cybersecurity incident. Okay, so, so, so Paul, looking at the big picture here, we started at the macro view and said, here's the cybersecurity, a lot of stuff that we wanna take into consideration. We next looked at the framework associated with it that we'd recommend that people consider being able to build it out. And now we've looked at the potential cost to be able to quantify what's our risk so we can match the appropriate response to those risks and build out a solid strategy. So the next phase, let's get tactical here and, and let's talk about how do you then build the strategy? We've, we've seen a lot of the, the big picture stuff. What are the brass tacks that we need to do to get there? Yeah, absolutely. So here at Raymond, we've, uh, we've built uh, our methodology, and, and this is something that I think a lot of organizations can adapt themselves, uh, that we call cyber ready. And so it, w this process is really meant to simplify the, how you go about approaching building your cybersecurity strategy and determining what controls, security controls to put in place to protect your environment and your assets. Uh, and so when we built this strategy, we based it on the NIST CSF, like we've been talking about, uh, and we've also incorporated other uh, elements from more advanced or more specific uh, uh, stra uh, frameworks that are out there, like the NIST 7621, which was another NIST adaptation specific to small businesses. And then we looked at some more advanced frameworks, like NIST 853 uh, and NIST 8171. 853 is for more enterprise grade security, and then 8171 is applicable to anyone that's in the Department of Defense space, in the Department of Defense industrial base. 
And so we incorporate a lot of those and in, in trying to come up with, hey, what, what should this actually look like for a small, medium-sized business or someone that's you know, a larger business but hasn't started their cybersecurity journey? And we really break this process down into five steps. So we'll talk through each of these steps, uh, but really the, you know, it's, it's five steps with four distinct processes in it. And this will help you actually build, determine what your strategy should be, and then build those specific elements of your strategy and the specific security controls that you should have in your organization. So the first step in that process is to build and start talking about strategy, to build the team that's going to determine what the strategy for your organization should be. You should be pulling together the executive team across your organization. Like we talked about earlier, this is not an IT risk. This is a business risk the IT team can help you address. And so you need to have those business and IT leaders all at the table together talking about where your organization is going to go. You want to start identifying who those key team members are, figure out who's going to take the formal ownership of the program. They're probably going to be have to delegate a lot of that responsibility across the organization, but you need to have someone who's a key owner and leader of the security journey. And then you want to start identifying the next steps in your process to actually build out your strategy and your governance. So when we do this here at Raymond, we do this as about a, an hour and a half, two hour uh, workshop where we get that executive team together. We talk through what that uh, cyber, some basics of cybersecurity, and then start talking about the specific strategy and where the program currently stands. From there, we actually go into the identify workshop. In the data identify or data identification workshop, we look at identifying what the assets are. And so this is actually really a series of meetings versus one workshop. You want to go interview those different key departmental representatives or leaders, whoever can actually speak to the assets that are key to keeping any department within your organization running forward. So what's most critical to them uh, to actually, whether that's a data sensitivity perspective or that's a, hey, here's the stuff that I need to keep performing my department's function. And so you're, you're going to be surveying those different individuals to identify what those assets are. Along the way, you want to be doing a risk assessment of each of those assets. So I showed earlier that risk assessment calculation of how do you actually calculate risk. So for each of those assets, you want to think about what is the, you know, what are the threats to that specific asset and the vulnerabilities that can impact it? What's the likelihood and impact, which are going to be the two key figures you want to actually calculate, the likelihood and impact of a vulnerability occurring and what happened in uh, downstream impacts from that vulnerability haven't occurred. That gives you a prioritization. And then as you're looking at, you've completed this process of identifying all your assets across your organization, and you've prioritized each of those. So now you can start looking at where you need to apply those security controls first. If you don't know what you're protecting, how can you know what tools to actually deploy in your environment to protect what you have? Uh, and so this is where a lot of organizations fall down is they don't get that good inventory of what assets they need to be protecting to make sure they're selecting the right tools and processes for them. And then we recommend going into what we call our protect workshop or protection strategy workshop. And so this workshop is really take going back and doing a self assessment or a gap assessment against a framework like the NIST CSF going through the 108 or so controls that are in the CSF and then identifying whether or not you have those controls in place. And then from there, where do you want to get to? What's your, based on your organization's ability to accept risk, how mature of a process do you want to have? And so as you look at each control and identify things you don't have in place, what's the target for your organization? And then building out a, a roadmap to actually build, uh, have additional security controls in place for each of those gaps which then segues into the next uh, step. So this isn't really usually a workshop. This is actually going to actually deploying those controls that were identified in each of the previous phases. As you actually deploy those controls, you know, oftentimes these controls can be challenging to implement. Consider bringing in outside resources. Here at Raymond, we have uh, a great engineering team that's, that helps organizations like yours actually deploy those security controls uh, and help determine what controls you should have in place. Finally, Making sure now that you've identified what your security control environment should look like, make sure you have this captured in good policy and procedure. Policy and procedure, when I talk to organizations, can be one of the biggest headaches for, for those organizations. I get that. It can be challenging to write this stuff. Uh, feel free to pull someone in uh, to help actually write this stuff and capture 
all that information that you've gathered from those previous steps into policy and procedure so that you can transfer it to other members of your organization. You can make sure those processes are repeatable. So we've talked a lot about uh, how you would actually go about developing that strategy and what your strategy should be responding to. What actually are some of the basics that your program should have? We talked about the strategy. You need to start with your strategy. Some of the, the questions that got sent in advance, talk about what three things should you actually, you know, what three tools should you pick and have any, in, in, excuse me, have in place in any organization. And this is where I'd say, actually, that question shows that leap to the tool when really you should be starting with the strategy and your strategy will identify the tools that you should have. As a part of that strategy, you should make sure you have that information security policy. This is capturing all the security controls across your environment. You need to make sure you have defined leadership roles and responsibilities. If this is not part of someone's formal job description to manage the cybersecurity program and the different elements of the, actually deploying the cybersecurity uh, responsibilities across the organization, then you're probably missing the gap. You probably don't have someone paying enough attention to this to ensure that your organization is adequately protected. You need to make sure you've identified those assets and deploy, identify the right protection strategies. And as you're identifying those assets, doing a risk assessment. One of the most key controls that any organization is gonna have, and this isn't recommending a specific tool, but saying that every organization should make sure you have a really good and robust backup policy and backup uh, uh, of your environment. You wanna be following the three, two, one strategy for backups, three copies of your data, Two different formats with at least one of those copies being off-site. And so uh, as you think about that, that means air gapping your data so that when an attacker breaks into your network, which they probably will eventually do, they aren't able to actually encrypt your backups or destroy your backups as well as the actual main copy of your data that's on site. Nine times out of 10, you're going to want to pull your data back from backups. And if you don't have good backups anymore because the attacker was able to get to them because they weren't air gapped, and separate from the rest of your network, you're probably gonna have to pay the ransom. And even after you pay the ransom, it's about a 40% chance you might not even be able to restore all the data anyways. Incident response plan and business continuity disaster recovery plans. So incident response plan is your specific plan to responding to that security incident. And so making sure you have plans in place that uh, give you that framework so that when that incident starts to occur, you have something to pick up that gives you a guide lines and a framework for how you're going to actually act so that you can uh, start executing those steps instead of trying to figure out what are you going to do. Uh, those incident response plans may tie into a business continuity or disaster recovery plan. If this is a truly catastrophic security incident or you have some other less cybersecurity focused incident that uh, turns into disaster for your organization, how are you going to keep running during your disaster scenario and then recover from that disaster scenario to resume, resume normal business operations. And then uh, from a strategy perspective and governance strategy, uh, governance approach perspective, one of the last pieces I talked about is vendor management. Third party risk and all those vendors you have that help you provide your great services to your customers and clients, um, they also present a lot of risk. You have uh, probably given them information or you, they're performing some function for you. But what are you going to do when there's a cybersecurity incident at that vendor? How do you know that vendor is deploying the same level of security control that you would expect for your own internal organization? And that comes down to the vendor management program. Your vendor management program is going to include things like your annual vendor assessments to make sure that they're continuing to deploy the controls that you made sure they had when you had your initial contracting conversations with them. How are you going to evaluate, evaluate security and influence uh, how they're deploying security in their environment? Uh, a couple other things that I'd highlight uh, is also things like making sure you have, uh, as you're thinking about selecting those tools, you're, you're going to wind up with things like making sure you have a good antivirus and those basics of IT that many organizations have been uh, tackling for years, making sure you've got those up to date and current. You're running current tools like not some form of a next gen AV or an endpoint detection response tool. And so those are things that will also come out of developing your specific strategy for your organization and can help you actually keep yourself protected going forward. With all that being said, uh, hopefully we've got some great questions out there. Uh, and yeah, look you know, Paul, to Paul, if I can jump in here really quick. Sure, so if, if we step back and look at the big picture here, 
it's a complete package here and it, it might and we talked a little bit before it might appear to be overwhelming and you know every journey starts with that first step you've heard the analogy how to eat an elephant you take it one bite at a time i know paul you've worked with quite a few organizations over the last couple of years of being able to do this so you can break these steps down into into sizable chunks that are realistic for the size of your organization and to be able to determine those things. And so feel free to reach out to us and ask any questions that you might have from that bigger picture. Uh, you know, circling back to the dam and, and the analogy and everything, and, and, and Paul, the, one aspect of the, the presentation, you talked about completeness. And, and that really stuck with me because of, as we said at the beginning that a lot of times people skip the planning and go straight to implementing the tools. And uh, I'm a fly fisherman. I was out on the river out in Montana a couple of years ago. And I remember seeing a bunch of pylons that they were driving into a river. They were going to be building a dam across there. And, and that was really kind of the genesis for the, the part of our conversation today. And what ends up happening is if you stick a couple pylons in, the water, as we said before, seeks that course of least resistance. And it just ends up going around the pylons. And so that, that's what ends up happening if you have those security tools that a lot of people go out and say, well, I've got no before, I train my employees, I got the EDR, I'm good to go. Well, that's like sticking just two pylons in a river because the water is going to flow right around those from any aspect along those lines. So that would be the final thought that I would suggest to you is to basically say, you want to have that strategy to cover the waterfront. And the best way to be able to do that is to first understand, you know, your organization, where you're headed, like Paul's talked about then talk and focus in on those crown jewels to protect the data, then determine your waterfront that you wanna do, build that out, and then make sure it's communicated. And if you follow those basic five steps, leverage some type of a methodology, you'll be all set to go. So Paul, with that, let's, uh, let's address some of those questions. I know uh, Rena, as well as Christina, you guys had some questions come up as well. Let's address those that are live right now, and then we can go to the ones that we got beforehand. Thank you, Jim. Our first question is from Mark, and he is asking, do you do any penetration testing? Paul? Great. Uh, easy answer for that one. Yes, we do. Uh, so actually, a couple of my team members, who I think are actually on the call here in the audience, uh, are uh, represent our, our penetration testing uh, team at the moment. And so they, they do a great job of helping organizations actually identify what vulnerabilities and weaknesses they have in their current setup. And if and I this, can... Go ahead, Paul. Uh, and so I would actually segue that into as you're building your strategy for uh, your cybersecurity, one of those things that you probably should be thinking about, and you'll see this in the NIST CSF, is how are you assessing whether or not your program is effective? And doing things like penetration testing is a great way to do that. Um, I personally recommend every organization do at least two vulnerability scans a year with at least one of those being accompanied by the penetration test. And so making, you know, bringing someone in like Raymond who can scan your environment, identify the weaknesses, and then see if they're actually able to break in using any of those weaknesses the same way that an attacker would be without all the destructive ramifications of an actual attacker breaking in. This allows you to figure out those gaps and, and holes and, and where the, the path of least resistance and the water is getting through your, your external boundary so that you can fix those holes. All right, thank you, Paul. Christina, additional questions, you're on mute as well. Thank you, yep, next question is from Chuck. He's asking to engage Raymond, what is the range of costs from small to medium size for this comprehensive service set? So I would say that that's a very tough question to answer uh, simply. And I'd say, I'd love to have a conversation with you about what specifically you're looking for what your environment looks like, because those things can really uh, impact what your eventual cost is from uh, deploying tools and identifying what your strategy should be. So I would love to have a follow-up conversation. I know my contact information is at the beginning of the sli uh, slide when that gets sent out later this afternoon. And then also we have the landing page on the next uh, slide that will allow you to uh, submit your contact info for a follow-up conversation. So, so, so if I can jump in here as well. So it is, um... As Paul had mentioned, it, and there's many methodologies that are out there to develop a strategy. This is one that we started seven years ago and we've tuned it over the years. And that's why we've broken it into these different workshops. So typically upfront to do that first strategy piece, it's about two hours of time with the executive team. So there's a lot of planning that goes into it from that vantage point. So from a price point perspective, that's gonna be a, a relatively minor investment. 
typically, depending upon the organization, when you get into the next phases, really like, for example, if you have an accounting department, you might have an operations department, a customer service department, that's where the range can change to be, to be able to understand what's the important data, what's that crown jewels, and how do we end up protecting it? So that's why uh, Paul's kind of saying, hey, what we'd really need to be able to do it. But a lot of times we can put the investment, make it appropriate for the size of an organization, and then also plan out the strategy because we have uh, a lot of services, for example, with VCSO, which is the virtual uh, CIO or VC, uh, security officer. And from there, you can plan that out and then map it out over a period of time. So it's, it's, a, it's an investment that you can make that makes sense that you can afford based on the risk that you've got. That's where we talk about the breach aspect of everything. So thanks for that, Chuck. And uh, if anybody else has questions, we're always available to answer those too. Christina Moore? Yes, um, we do have a few more live ones. I'm gonna swap over to those that were submitted beforehand just so we can answer some of those as well. Okay. Um, our first one is, how do I convince my leadership to invest in this type of technology? A lot of the folks that reach out to me and I have initial conversations with are whatever the, you know, represents the IT uh, staff of the organization. And this is a challenge that a lot of those individuals face. The reality is that this can be very challenging to communicate, hey, why should we be investing in these? And the part of the key is, is translating what the actual risk is to the organization. We need to talk dollars and cents when we're talking to business leaders in order to show why it makes sense to invest in these tools and technologies and strategies. And so as you're taking a step back, you're having that uh, monthly uh, business review with your executive team, you need to be able to show them some of those calculations that we just uh, went through on how do you actually calculate the impact of a cybersecurity incident uh, for your organization. And if you're talking about $1.5 million of exposure uh, over the course and on average that might be realized every four years, you you're probably, you can look at that cost and say, hey, yeah, spending 10, 15, $20,000 on some PCI cyber, uh, cybersecurity program can make sense in order to address $1.5 million of exposure. So the key is to take it away from the technical speak and translate it into dollars and cents that are what your business leaders are looking for. Yeah, and piggybacking on what, what Paul's saying, is he's hit, hit the nail on the head there. It, we need to talk in terms of what our executive team is interested in. So, uh, and, and being part of the technical community, a lot of times we talk in the tech talk and that's not necessarily gonna translate well. So that's why we put that breach cost in there is it's dollars and cents and you can make an informed decision. If I have hundred records at $429, that's a small risk. So I'm not gonna invest a lot of time and energy because it's not gonna impact me. But we had a client that had 300,000 healthcare records and you multiply that out times $429 a record they can get very expensive. So that, that gets people's attention is from the dollar perspective. Uh, Christina, I know we had more questions. I've seen a couple more popping up here as well. So where should we go next? Yep, I'm gonna do one more that was submitted ahead of time. Um, this question is, what, do, what does cyber insurance policies really cover? I've had a number of conversations with various business leaders about this who look at what their policy is covering and they're saying, why would I ever pay for this? And the reality is that when you actually look at uh, what you're getting for your, your policy, it can be highly customized and you get what you pay for. And so uh, when you take a step back and build your cybersecurity strategy, one of the security controls that you probably should have in place is cybersecurity insurance. However, you want to make sure you're buying the right amount. Uh, and so as you look at mitigating the risk for your organization based on security controls you're deploying, that might allow you to buy less cybersecurity insurance and make sure you're paying for the right things in your premiums. So um, it's highly dependent on the, the actual policy that you have. It's important to understand what's covering your policy because not all policies are created equal. So. Hey, Christine, I think there was a, I saw something pop up on the screen real quick. Somebody said they were insurance business. Can you read that question? Make sure we address that one right now as well. Do you have that out there? Um, any any cybersecurity insurance suggested um, for coverage? Is that the question you're referring to? I just saw one pop up and it disappeared really quick. Paul, any, any initial thoughts? Yeah, so I'd, I'd go back to actually what I just I said on that one, Jim. The, uh, it's going to be highly customized to your, your environment. There's some great security insurance coverage out there uh, or providers out there. 
uh, but they're going to have a, a lengthy conversation with you about what your controls are when they're determining whether or not they're even going to insure you in the first place. Right. And, and, and I know the rules, the rules, the road have changed a lot, you know, in the last three or four years before you could just buy the cybersecurity policy and off you go. Now they're like what you're saying. Now there's basically saying, you know, I'm from Missouri. Show me. How, how are you protecting yourself from that vantage point? We actually okay. saw a huge spike in that in Q1 of this calendar year where we started getting a ton of requests from our customers or, or folks that were looking for help figuring out how to answer the five to 10 page security questionnaires they were getting from their uh, security insurance provider. And so uh, it can be challenging. Okay, I think we got five minutes to go, Christina. Uh, a couple thoughts. We had people that sent questions in in advance. If we don't get to your questions today, do we have a way of getting them an email back, Christina? Yes, we will have them either submit the form or they can um, email you guys directly. Okay, perfect. All right, so what, where should we go to next with the questions team? Yep, our next question is, are there any recommendations for addressing labor shortages of qualified cybersecurity staff in West Michigan market? Implement these initiatives. Uh, yes, um, I do. And the reality is that, especially for many small and medium-sized businesses, you're frankly not gonna have the budget for a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer, along with a full security staff that's just not reasonable for most organizations to afford. And so as you look at uh, pulling in the right vendor, I know we did a recent webinar that talked about, hey, focus on what you specialize in. Um, blank on what the actual title was, but you focus on what you specialize in and then bring in experts to do this as their day job and spread that, that cost across many organizations. And so uh, reach out to us. We'd love to have a conversation with you about how we can help because we can help you focus on what you actually do best. And, and Paul, in, in addition to that, if you look at it from an IT perspective across just beyond the cybersecurity aspect, uh, and a study was done not too long ago, and they identified about 15 different skill sets that organizations need to deploy today in order to maintain and run their IT shop. Okay, so if, if I'm a small and medium sized business, where am I going to find one individual that's got 15 different skill sets? that's up to speed, that can do it and, and protect my organization. So that, that's why a lot of people are now deploying the outsourcing strategy of being able to go out and find the right vendors to be able to assist them. And then the beauty of it is, is that you can take that, let's, let's say a, a resource costs $100,000 a year to be able to do a particular skill set. If you can share that across 20 to 30 organizations, that's a bite size that somebody can afford to be able to get that type of skill set Whereas if I'm a small to medium sized business, I don't know if I can afford to have that big staff on, on staff. So that, that's another aspect along those lines as well. Thank you. Um, it looks like we have time for about one more question. Um, I'm gonna pull Mary's question real quick. Um, what are the benefits of hiring Raymond for this type of service versus a dedicated IT and cybersecurity company? So I would actually respond by saying that, um, so within Raymond, we have a fantastic team here at Raymond Technology Solutions, who the RTS team is a dedicated IT and cybersecurity company. We are an MSP and an MSSP. Uh, so we provide basic IT services as well as managed security services. So we would love to help you with those, those pieces. And then we also have a bunch of other fantastic experts in other areas of your business as well. Whether you need help with HR outsourcing or some sort of HR need, we have uh, great resources that uh, by having that relationship with us, we can also pull those people into the conversations to help you, again, focus on what you do best. Paul, in addition to that, we launched our cybersecurity practice in the early 2000s. And so we're not a Johnny come lately. Uh, Jessica Dory and her team, the technology risk management team, which is part of the Raymond Technology Services team, has been working with organizations, identifying risks all the way back to like 2002. And, and so there's a deep skill set, lots of years of experience and a passion for this. And so the, thanks for that question. Thank you, everyone. I know we did not have time to get to everyone's questions today. If you do have additional questions and would like to reach out, um, Paul, if you can hop to the next slide, um, there's a QR code and you can scan that code um, and submit a form and we can get your questions answered today. Um, if not, um, you can always email the panelists. Um, we will be sending out this recording this afternoon and their contact information is on there. Um, thank you all for attending today. 
Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye now. Thanks all.